with the recent release of its PS5 remake, its upcoming 10 year anniversary, and its currently airing TV adaptation, there's seemingly never been a better time to talk about The Last of Us. The game is a landmark, not only in developer Naughty Dog's career and the hardware capabilities of the 7th generation consoles, but in how the industry can be used to tell a story. Everybody knows this game. It took the world by storm upon its release in 2013, and has clearly stood the test of time. Despite the fact that it's now been remastered for PS4 and remade for PS5, the original PS3 version does still hold up. A testament to how universal the thing is, is that my dad, whose video game exploits peaked at Sonic 2 in the 90s and the occasional Medal of Honor match with me as a kid, played and finished the thing two Christmases back. He watched me play for about an hour and wanted to experience the story for himself. But why is The Last of Us so well regarded? After all, it's just another post-apocalyptic, zombie-infested, third-person stealth action game. Except that it isn't. This is a story about people and how they connect with one another. Now, even that in and of itself isn't entirely unique, look at Telltale's Walking Dead, but what this game does differently is peel apart the layers of a broken person's mentality and asks the question, why do they do what they do? This isn't exactly an easy question to answer, so let's take another look at the story and examine why it does what it does so well. So get ready, strap yourselves in, and let's talk about The Last of Us. Oh, and spoilers, obviously. The game begins with our protagonist Joel arriving home late from work one night. He comes home to find his daughter Sarah still awake, who then proceeds to give him a birthday present, a new watch. Things soon escalate when Sarah wakes up again in the middle of the night to find the town falling apart due to an unknown infection spreading through the nearby city. Joel, along with Sarah and his brother Tommy, evacuate the city where they get cornered by a patrolling soldier. Joel explains that they're not infected, and the soldier radios in for orders. Despite being hesitant to actually do it, the soldier raises his rifle and fires at them, causing them to tumble down a small hill. Tommy shoots and kills the soldier, but it's too late, as Sarah was hit in all the chaos. Move your hands, baby. I know, baby, I know. God. Listen to me, I know this hurts. You're gonna be okay, baby, stay with me. I'll pick you up. I know, baby. I know it hurts. Come on, baby. Please. I know, baby. I know. Sarah. She dies in Joel's arms, and we smash cut to 20 years later. The world has now been overrun by the Cordyceps fungal infection that takes over the host's motor functions and attempts to spread the illness further. They're zombies. Mushroom zombies. Joel and his accomplice Tess are smugglers who are on a mission to retrieve some guns that were stolen from them when they run into Marlene, the leader of the Fireflies. Now the Fireflies are a revolutionary militia group hell-bent on finding a vaccine for the Cordyceps infection. Marlene offers to give Joel and Tess the guns they came for and more if they help her smuggle something to the Capitol building located nearby in Boston. Initially running on the assumption that Ellie is the daughter of some bigwig, they eventually come to discover that she is the one and only case of an immune survivor of the outbreak. She has a bite mark that's three weeks old and shows no sign of turning. From here, the game is mostly about protecting Ellie as you try to deliver her to the Fireflies who hope to engineer a cure to the infection. As I touched on earlier, The Last of Us isn't fundamentally a unique game, or story for that matter. There are countless zombie experiences out there, I've put out a video on Days Gone which is one of them. But even with its stance of not being about the zombies, but the people, it isn't really a wholly unique setup. I mentioned The Walking Dead as a comparison for this post-viral outbreak narrative focused story about people, and while that game does have its merit, what The Last of Us does is truly different. 
It may be hard to decipher why on the surface, but it delves into these themes and ideas far more deeply than its counterparts. The Walking Dead seems to want to tell a story about where these people end up after certain significant events happen in their life, but The Last of Us wants to tell why these people end up here. As a protagonist, Lee is serviceable. He's fine, but ultimately uninteresting when compared to not just Joel, but any of the characters here. Lee is undoubtedly a good person. The game tries to throw shade on this matter by having you start in a police car on your way to prison, but during the events of the story, nothing is really there to suggest that he isn't an upstanding person. He's friendly to those he meets, he's helpful to strangers, and essentially adopts a little girl that he finds alone more or less instantly. Clementine herself is a sweet, innocent child that doesn't fully understand the world she now inhabits, and so looks to Lee to protect her. Compare this with Joel, and the difference is night and day. He's tired, callous, and impatient, which has earned him a reputation in the local quarantine zone. He doesn't have the same respect that Tess does, and seems to play this role of the muscle or backup. Once you begin your journey with Ellie, Joel is cold and standoffish. He doesn't really want anything to do with this, and is only in it for what he has to personally gain. When he finds out that Ellie has been bitten, he immediately wants to turn around and hand her back over to Marlene. Now, don't get me wrong, this video isn't designed to push the agenda of Joel is an evil man, but instead examine how The Last of Us portrays its characters in a more realistic and interesting way. Joel isn't a mean two-dimensional character, He's just damaged and likes to keep things at an arm's reach, so he won't get too attached to something that he can lose again. This comes into play far later in the story, but already this is much more depth than the characters in The Walking Dead demonstrate. I love Clementine, because she's hopeful and optimistic. But I also love Ellie, who is also those things, but isn't solely defined by archetypal traits. She is probably the most optimistic person in the game, but that doesn't mean she's constantly lifting the mood or acting as the voice of reason. Like Joel, she's also brash and quick to anger. The choices that you make in The Walking Dead are traditional traditional apocalyptic decisions or philosophy questions. Do you take the supplies from the seemingly abandoned car to help your group? Who do you give the three pieces of food to? Which person do you want to save? These are all memorable moments from that game, but all of the decisions are generally a binary choice where most people tend to agree on what the right or wrong answer is. Conversely, in The Last of Us, we obviously don't make these decisions as the player, but Joel's actions are all understandable from his past experiences. These aren't survival choices, they're personal choices, and we understand why the characters make each and every one of them. This is what sets The Last of Us apart from the crowd. In the case of Joel, there are two main contributing factors as to why he's developed a habit of putting up walls around himself. One is the general cutthroat nature of the world he now lives in, and how he has to become rather ruthless in order to survive. The other is the loss of his daughter. We don't spend a lot of time with Sarah in the game, but from what we're able to see, we learn that she's a sweet young girl who had a cutesy relationship with her father, and died far too young. Joel's response to this, and how he survived for over two decades, is to bury it deep down and pretend it never happened. Ellie is a stark reminder of Sarah, and Joel doesn't know how to process this. Granted, he might not realise that this is what's happening straight away, but he is subconsciously making these connections already. When they first meet, Joel is cold and uninterested in Ellie. He doesn't want to form a bond or become friends. He wants to get the job done as quickly as possible. Ellie initially refuses to tell him why Marlene wants her smuggled in the first place, and Joel doesn't seem overly bothered either way. You don't know the best thing about my job. I don't gotta know why. To be honest with you, I give two shits what you're up to. At the safe house, Ellie tells Joel that his watch is broken, which he obviously already knows. But what's interesting here is just how complicated Joel is as a character. What I've been saying so far about him wanting to pretend things never happened is immediately contradicted by the fact that he still wears the watch that Sarah bought for his birthday. In fact, the watch is broken during the fall in the prologue, so not only is it a reminder of his daughter, but it's stuck on the exact time that she died. He simultaneously wants to move on, but also struggles to let go. 
That's such a human thing to do. It's easy to forget that these characters are created by a writer and not actual tangible people. This is exemplified when Ellie appreciates the view from a rooftop and Joel subtly glances down at his watch. This is the very first step of his arc across the story. From here on, Joel is a little more open and understanding of Ellie. Not a hugely significant amount, but now is more willing to humour her questions and make idle chit chat instead of mostly ignoring her. However, the pair's relationship isn't exactly a smooth transition. For every milestone the two make in developing their relationship, something usually happens to cause tension. It's sort of a two steps forward, one step back kind of deal. And the first hiccup is Tess's death. Once the trio arrive at the Capitol building, they find that the Firefly extraction team have been killed and that the military have surrounded the exterior. Joel wants to go home, but Tess reveals that she's been bitten from a recent struggle with the infected. <laughs> Oops, right? Give me your arm. This was three weeks. I was bitten an hour ago and it's already worse. This is fucking real, Joel. She tells Joel to find Tommy, who as a former Firefly will be able to help him take Ellie to the right people, and she stays behind to buy them time. After the two leave, Ellie tries to comfort Joel, but he isn't having any of it. Hey look, um, about Tess, I, I don't even know what Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess, ever. Matter of fact, we just keep our histories to ourselves. Now, while the majority of this video does focus on Joel and Ellie, I do occasionally want to touch on the minor characters that play a small part in the grand scheme of things. Because even if they don't necessarily set the wheels in motion to push the plot along, each survivor that we meet along the way have their own issues and subtly serve to either warn us or teach us a lesson about our heroes. Tess was Joel's partner, we know this much. We know that she could be cold when necessary, but also has a gentle side that seemed desperate to come out. Also, Tess and Joel's relationship is left rather ambiguous whether or not it was romantic or platonic. After 20 years, she seemed to be the only person that Joel has allowed himself to get close to. He is concerned when she arrives with cuts and bruises on her face. And while we aren't privy to the details of their past, Tess does say in her final moments, Look. There's enough here that you have to feel some sort of obligation to me so you get her to Tommy's. This could either be a frustrated remark brought on by unrequited love, or just a general statement based on their years of watching out for each other. However, her choice of words are interesting because she's essentially guilting Joel into doing a job that he doesn't want to do. They're both suspicious upon learning of Ellie's condition, but once she's bitten, she latches on to the only hope she has. Not for her survival, it's already too late for her, but for mankind's survival. She's grown sick of the misery and watching the world destroy itself, and uses her final moments not to make a big scene or a big speech, but to ensure that Joel sees this thing out to the end. From this point on, we can engage in optional conversations with Ellie, where the two speak about nothing in particular, just random observations and comments about what they find on their journey. They're not overtly important, but it is worth mentioning because these small moments do a lot of the work of making us care for the two. Since they need a vehicle to make it to Wyoming, they decide to visit Bill, an acquaintance of Joel's that owes him a few favours. Upon reaching Bill's town, they find that he's gone a little stir-crazy over the years and in his paranoia has set up booby traps all throughout the streets. Once we actually make it to the man himself, he immediately handcuffs Ellie to a nearby post and knocks Joel to the floor, annoyed that we've detonated a bunch of his traps. After he calms down, we learn that he's clearly been alone for some time and has developed a personal code which he strictly abides by in order to survive. One of these rules seems to entail sticking by himself. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. A partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing, getting you killed. So you know what I did? I wisened the fuck up. I realized it's gotta be just me. Such an outlook on life is kind of bleak, but Bill's feelings are confirmed when the trio stumble across a hanged man in a nearby garage. This is Frank. 
Bill's partner, and the man whom he tried to care for and protect for a period of time. He seems pretty shaken up by the discovery, although he does try to hide it. We find a suicide note nearby and learn that Frank took matters into his own hands after being infected so that he wouldn't become a monster. This is all very upsetting on the surface anyway, but to me, Bill serves as a warning as to what Joel could become if he doesn't learn to accept Ellie. Bill saw Frank as a liability, and chose to cut him loose so that he could continue to survive on his own. Except, when we find him, he's hardly thriving. He's a sad, lonely, bitter soul who is surviving, but not exactly living. This is a wake-up call for Joel to start working with Ellie as a team, so that he can avoid this tragic fate. Once the pair acquire a working vehicle, they make it all the way to Pennsylvania without any headaches. That is until a stranger stumbles into the road calling for help. Ellie wants to help, but Joel just tells her to put her seatbelt on. What about the guy? Uh, he ain't even hurt. <laughs> Eventually, the pair crash into a nearby shop and fend off the oncoming hunters. After fleeing away from the highway on foot, they pass through an abandoned hotel where Ellie asks Joel how he knew about the ambush, to which he responds, I've been on both sides. This isn't explored any further, but it is interesting to note that even before he was a smuggler, he's had to involve himself in some shady dealings over the last two decades. A little later, Joel tells Ellie to stay back while he pushes on to check that the coast is clear. He gets surprised by a bandit that was hiding nearby, and the two enter a struggle which very nearly results in Joel being drowned in a nearby pool of water. At the last minute, however, Ellie appears and shoots the attacker in the head. Joel snaps at her and reminds her that he told her to stay back, which Ellie doesn't really appreciate given that she just saved his life. Now this moment is actually significant for two different reasons. One, this is the first time that Ellie has taken a life. It certainly won't be the last, but for a 14 year old girl to finally have the realisation that sometimes it's kill or be killed, it will be a turning point in her life. And two, Joel's instant reaction isn't to berate her. The first thing said is Ellie exclaiming, yeah. I shot the hell out of that guy, huh? It's only when she says that she feels sick that Joel responds with anger and frustration. I think his instant reaction is to console her, but then he remembers that Ellie isn't his daughter and he has that, oh I've let this go too far moment. It's such a small detail that's very easily overlooked, but it's those subtle facial tics that you only notice on your fourth playthrough that makes The Last of Us so fondly remembered. Anyways, Ellie reassures Joel that she'll obey his instructions from now on, but will respond in a very passive-aggressive manner when you try to talk to her. That is, until they reach an impasse when the road is blocked by more bandits. Joel teaches her how to fire a rifle and asks her to cover him with suppressive fire while he sneaks through the area. After this whole sequence, he thanks her for saving him and entrusts her with a pistol. There isn't a big thank you moment between the two, but you can tell that Joel, despite trying to push his feelings back, is beginning to trust her, and she honestly appreciates it. She hates it when people think she isn't capable because she's just a kid, and throughout the story of The Last of Us, she proves herself more than capable. It just took a moment like this for Joel to see it. So a little later on, the two bump into another pair of survivors, Henry and his younger brother Sam. And these two make a pretty significant impact on Joel and Ellie's lives. Their dynamics essentially mirror each other. Joel and Henry feel as though they've been tasked with protecting an ultimately defenceless child through a harsh world, and have trouble honestly opening up to them. Henry seems unable, or at least unwilling, to confess the truth to Sam that their group likely hadn't survived and seems to delay the inevitable fact that Sam will get hurt eventually. He's so paranoid and focused on keeping his brother safe that Sam becomes terrified of anything out of his control. When the two get separated, Henry becomes frantic and makes Joel promise to keep Sam safe. The reason this is significant is that this is another time that The Last of Us uses a fellow survivor to teach Joel a lesson. Where Bill demonstrated the potential repercussions of cutting off the people close to you, Henry represents the danger of babying them to the point that they're dependent on you. While certainly not meant in malice, 
Henry does think that Sam is incompetent and wouldn't be able to survive on his own, and the way he dealt with this sort of created a self-fulfilling prophecy. Ultimately, Henry was right. Sam gets bitten and keeps it hidden from the group until he turns overnight and nearly kills Ellie the following morning. Sam was so scared of what might happen that he ended up dying alone and putting everyone else's life in danger. This even resulted in his older brother then having to put him down. Joel and Ellie learn something from this interaction. From this point on, Joel is more receptive to Ellie's comments on things and is far more trusting that she'll watch his back. Ellie goes from being combative and impulsive to following Joel's orders when necessary, but still having the agency to be self-sufficient. There is a point where Henry, Sam and Ellie have climbed onto a nearby truck, and the ladder breaks before Joel can make it himself. Instead of helping him up, Henry prioritises Sam and abandons Joel to the infected. Now, despite being in a position of safety, Ellie chooses to jump down off of the truck to stick with Joel. Not because she needs him to protect her, but because she wants to be with him. When the four eventually meet back up, Joel is understandably pissed, but Henry reminds him that if the roles were reversed, he would have done exactly the same thing. Joel doesn't say anything, but he knows he's right. They see eye to eye because of just how similar they are. As we flash forward from summer to fall, Joel and Ellie arrive at a dam in Jackson, Wyoming, where Tommy is based. Joel's plan is to drop Ellie off with Tommy, who will then deliver her the rest of the way to the Fireflies. Tommy says that he left that cause behind him years ago, and now wants to live a quiet, peaceful life with his new family. Joel gets frustrated that Tommy won't take Ellie off his hands, Ellie is frustrated that Joel wants her off his hands, and Tommy is frustrated that he's even involved at all. This all culminates in Ellie stealing a horse and running away to a nearby abandoned house to ponder in solitude. Joel and Tommy follow after her, where they finally confront the situation head on. Ellie is a little ahead of Joel in willing to talk openly about her feelings, where Joel is still holding back. We're leaving. And if I say no? Do you even realize what your life means? Huh? Running off like that, putting yourself at risk? It's pretty goddamn stupid. Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. What do you want from me? Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. Tommy knows this area. Oh, better fuck than... that. Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm going to end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. And we are going our separate ways. Get it together. We're not alone. It's fairly obvious at this point that Joel isn't really leaving her behind because he thinks Tommy can take care of her better, but because he's afraid of making that connection with her. You can tell that when she brings up Sarah, Joel is so very near breaking, but instead of opening up, he disparages Ellie's claims about losing people. You have no idea what loss is tells us so much about him and how close he is to cracking. And after a brief combat sequence, the three of them ride back to the dam, where Tommy offers to take Ellie off his hands, but Joel says no. This is one of the most significant points in the story. The most significant comes a little later, but after hearing her out and having some time to think on it, Joel is now willing to commit himself to Ellie. He's not being bought by Marlene, he's not being guilted by Tess, 
for the first time, he's making his own mind up to see this thing through to the end. Tommy even gives him an easy out, but he declines. This is the beginning of Joel's new path. Two weeks later, the pair arrive at the University of Eastern Colorado, where the Fireflies are supposedly based. Joel and Ellie are now clearly far more friendly with each other and make idle chat about those pointless conversations about unimportant things in life. Joel is teaching her the rules of American football, and they seem to be getting on really well now. There's a mutual respect that the two have developed. They're more open, but also aware of when they're pressing too far. Wow. What happened? Okay. Too much? Too much. It's sweet that Joel is now willing to share more details of his life before the outbreak, but Ellie understands when she's verging on crossing the line into making him uncomfortable. He tells her that when he was younger he wanted to be a singer, and that he never went to college because he had Sarah at a young age. Ellie confesses that she wants to be an astronaut, which is such a kid thing to want to be. I feel like for most of the story, we forget that Ellie is still only a child, and it's these little things that bring her back down to earth considering she's relatively mature for her age. The two continue to bond when they come across the skeleton of a firefly and a tape recorder that states they've all abandoned the university and relocated to Salt Lake City in Utah. Pretty soon after, they're both ambushed by a group of bandits, and in the struggle, Joel is mortally wounded after being impaled on a stray piece of rebar. The two struggle to escape the campus, with more bandits arriving by the second, and Joel continuously losing a lot of blood. Eventually though, they both manage to escape on horseback, but Joel's wounds are taking a toll, and he falls onto the ground. Ellie begs him to get up, stating that she doesn't know what to do, and from here, we skip to winter. In the subsequent months, Joel has been lying in a dirty basement cellar as Ellie tends to his wounds and spends her days looting and hunting for themselves. In this section, we play as Ellie. Now, this is hugely significant because, for the first time, we've completely switched dynamics. Joel was Ellie's protector, a strong guardian that knows how to get his hands dirty and will do anything necessary to protect those he cares about. But now, Ellie has to become the protector. She doesn't have the experience or desire really to do these things, but realises that if she wants to keep them both alive, she'll have to. And this never becomes more relevant than it does after she meets David. During one afternoon, Ellie is hunting a deer when she comes across two survivors out in the woods, David and James. They mention that they have a camp with many survivors who are going hungry, and offer her some supplies in return for the meat of the deer she just killed. They offer weapons, ammunition and clothes, but Ellie asks specifically for medicine. James leaves to go get the medicine, while David and Ellie stay with the deer. Ellie keeps her bow on him for a good while and refuses to answer when he asks for her name. She's clearly come far enough now to realise what's at stake here, and how she has to behave if she wants to survive in this world. David and James seem like decent enough people, but Ellie isn't concerned with coming across as rude when the alternative could be far worse. The two talk for a while until they're attacked by a nearby group of infected, where David reveals that he had a gun the whole time. After they clear the threat and James returns with the medicine, David tells Ellie that it was his men who attacked them at the university. A few weeks back, I sent a group of men out nearby town to look for food. Only a few came back. He said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. And get this, he's a crazy man traveling with a little girl. You see, everything happens for a reason. Ellie immediately realizes the danger she's in, but David seems to let her go. 
After returning to Joel, she administers the medicine, but has to take off again fairly quickly as she realises that she's been tracked by David's gang. She eventually gets captured and is placed in a holding cell, where she learns that David is not only a cannibal, but also a hebophile. It's not too long after this that Joel wakes up. Still suffering from his injuries at the university, Joel stumbles his way through the nearby towns looking for Ellie, and is able to overpower two members of David's group. Now, where before I mentioned how Ellie had fallen into this position of needing to do the necessary things to survive, here we can see how Joel handles the same scenario with frightening contrast. Ellie clearly doesn't want to act the way she's been acting or do the things she's been doing, but she understands that she will have to do these uncomfortable things to keep her and Joel alive. However, when put in this scenario where he's looking for Ellie and has two men prisoner, Joel displays a horrific sense of malice to get his way. He tortures this man until he gives away his camp's location, and then kills them both in pretty brutal ways. Joel doesn't just want information from these two, he wants them to suffer, and that is what separates Joel from Ellie here. While he makes his way over there, we cut back to Ellie who has managed to escape the cell, but eventually gets cornered by David in an abandoned restaurant. The two silently stalk each other for a while until David manages to overpower Ellie and mount her in an attempt to throttle her, but she does manage to get him off. Ellie is in such hysterics at this point and is caught at such a vulnerable moment that she doesn't even realise at first that it's Joel whose arms are holding her. He comforts her, tells her that it's going to be okay, and calls her baby girl. Now back earlier when I said that the most significant moment in this pair's relationship would come later, this is it. In case you've forgotten, Baby Girl is the nickname that Joel gave to Sarah. It's what he called her as she died in his arms, and him calling Ellie that now is the final chink in his armour breaking. At this moment, Joel accepts Ellie as his surrogate daughter. It brings him comfort because in his mind, it's kind of like reliving that moment from the prologue, but things get to end differently. His daughter is still here, not only that, but he didn't have to do anything, she took care of herself, she's a survivor. And for Ellie, this is the moment she knows that she doesn't have to be alone anymore. She mentions to Sam that her biggest fear is being abandoned, and here, now in this moment, she knows that Joel isn't going anywhere. We now have our next time jump into spring, which indicates that this journey has been ongoing for the best part of nine months now. Joel seems to have recovered from his injury at this point, and is talking to Ellie in a far more comfortable and relaxed manner than previously. He even says he'll teach her to play guitar, but Ellie seems… off. I think that because of the story's pacing, people tend to assume that this is because of what she just went through with David, but try to remember that this is now three odd months later. Not to say that the events haven't affected her in any way, but I think her silent daydreaming here is more to do with the awareness of what's to come. Joel is always stuck in the moment. In the beginning, it's all about surviving, right here, right now. And in this particular moment, he's relishing in having that kind of relationship with his child again. But Ellie is looking ahead. The two are quickly approaching Salt Lake City, and she knows that their journey is almost over. Her time with Joel is ending, but not long afterwards, something catches her attention that seems to perk her up a bit. The two climb a nearby building and come across a herd of giraffes that escaped what once would have been the local zoo. They don't pose a threat or really have any significance to the plot at all, but they do provide our protagonists with a moment of levity in this long, gruesome journey they've been on. They serve as a reminder of what once was, and what could be again if the Fireflies are able to reverse engineer a vaccine to cure the Cordyceps infection. 
And this really hits home when you realise that you can stay here with Ellie and watch them roam around for as long as you like. Joel only backs away when you press a button on the controller. For this moment, you are Joel, and you can just appreciate this slice of life with Ellie. It's pretty sweet. A short while later, Ellie begins to talk about Sarah. Is that after you lost Sarah? Yes, it will. I can't imagine losing someone you love like that. Losing everything that you know. I'm sorry, Joel. That's okay, Ellie. There is such a stark difference as to how Joel and Ellie approach this situation compared to how they did back in Fall. Ellie is far more respectful than she was initially, and approaches the subject with care and sincerity. She feels for Joel's loss. Joel realises what Ellie is doing, and he appreciates the sentiment. She even offers him a photograph of Sarah that Tommy also did earlier, which Joel refused to accept. But now, he takes it. Not only has the pair's relationship blossomed over the span of several months, but now Joel is more open to accepting his past and learning from it instead of just pretending that it never happened. What shortly follows is another puzzle water traversal sequence where Joel and Ellie get pulled underneath the surface. Ellie obviously can't swim, so Joel struggles to get them both onto dry land and begins giving chest compressions to try and resuscitate her. Then two soldiers arrive and one knocks Joel unconscious with the butt of his rifle. After waking up, he finds himself at the Fireflies HQ, greeted by Marlene. After waking, Joel asks to see Ellie, but Marlene says it won't be possible because she's being prepped for surgery. Joel asks what she means, and she explains that the cordyceps grows over the brain, and in Ellie's case has mutated, which means that she will likely be killed in the process of reverse engineering the vaccine. Joel obviously protests, but Marlene shuts him down immediately, saying that it's worth losing one life to possibly save humanity. Joel isn't impressed, and her response is actually very interesting. She tells him that she's sure he's had a difficult time getting here, but it's nothing compared to what she's been through. Since we're talking morality here, I find it kind of interesting that so many of these characters insist that they've had it worse than everybody else. There's this weird need to invalidate everybody else's experience so that they can keep preaching this woe is me stuff, and spread the word that I had it worse. But whatever it is you think you're going through right now is nothing to what I have been through. Tim. You have no idea what loss is. For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Took care? That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me. It wasn't worth it. There's enough here that you have to feel some sort of obligation to me so you get her to Tommy's. Anyway, after a brief conversation, she leaves him with a soldier and tells him to escort Joel from the premises and kill him if he tries anything. As he's being marched down the corridor, Joel manages to overpower the soldier and once again tortures a man for information to find out where the operating room is. Once he has what he needs, Joel proceeds to execute the soldier and rampage through the entire hospital, taking out countless fireflies along the way. Once he reaches the operating room, he kills the head surgeon, a decision I'm sure he isn't going to regret at some point, and lifts Ellie off of the table. Now, this whole section is incredibly significant, not just for the plot of The Last of Us, but also for its story and themes. If you recall, we began the game as Sarah, but the first time that we took control of Joel, we were carrying his daughter in our arms. And now here we are, the last time we play as Joel, with his daughter in our arms. It's not a coincidence that Sarah was killed by a soldier with a torch-mounted rifle, because while Joel is trying to escape the Firefly Hospital, the whole threat is more soldiers with torch-mounted rifles. The beginning of the game and the end of the game mirror each other beautifully. For Joel, this is the same situation, with the same stakes, but this time, he isn't going to lose. He manages to escape the onslaught from the nearby soldiers and get away through the nearby lift. He exits into the car park, where he once again comes across Marlene. You can't save her. Even if you get her out of here, then what? 
How long before she's torn to pieces by a pack of clickers? That is, if she hasn't been raped and murdered first. It ain't for you to decide. It's what she'd want. And you know it. Look. You can still do the right thing here. She won't feel anything. still wearing off. What happened? We found the fireflies. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that are immune. There's dozens, actually. I ain't done a damn bit of good, neither. They've actually... They've stopped looking for a cure. I'm taking us home. I'm sorry. Everything that's happened, everything that we've experienced through hours of gameplay and interacting with these two characters, all culminate here. Joel made a decision that would go on to shape the trajectory of both of their lives. Now, I'm not even going to get into the sequel and how that expands on this, but even from this first game alone, we know how this is going to play out. There are so many micro details to pick apart here, like how all of the lies Joel could have told. He says that there are dozens more like her. This was probably the most hurtful thing that Joel could have said at that moment. We learn a little later that Ellie spent a small amount of time with a friend called Riley, and one day they were both bitten. Riley succumbed to the infection and died, but obviously Ellie lived on. She spent the whole time since waiting for her turn. She wants her life to mean something, and when Joel simply says that there are plenty of others like you, she hears that she isn't important anymore. Her survivor's guilt made her happy to sacrifice her life to save humanity, but that chance was taken from her. A while later, they arrive back at Jackson, where Ellie has clearly been thinking about what Joel told her. She's fairly confident that what he's told her isn't true, and he's fairly confident that she knows that. But the two reach this impasse of, we both know it's a lie, but shall we go on trying to believe it anyway? Ellie strongly suspects what Joel did to the Fireflies, and she feels guilty about it. However, she's willing to go along with it to secure their relationship because she has nothing else, and after all this, she can't bear being alone. But before she can come to terms with that, she needs to be sure. Right now, Swear to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. The Last of Us is not a story about zombies. It's about two people who are lost and find solace in each other to make it through the world. We grow to care for these characters in a way that, even when a video like this tries to dissect the morality of their choices, we don't really care. Is Joel a good person? Well, the honest answer is entirely subjective, but does it even matter? How do you even decide something like that? He must be a bad guy, considering he doomed the world, right? I mean, he probably wouldn't make a great world leader or anything, but he would be a great dad. 
It's all the little things that make up a person's character. If somebody's only interaction with you was after you'd had a bad day and you'd had a temper at the time, they'd probably think you were a bad person. But do you think that the people you paint with the evil brush wake up every morning wondering how they're going to be a bastard today? Probably not. It's entirely a matter of perspective. Joel's decision at the end of The Last of Us has been picked apart by people for what's soon approaching to be a decade, and many have justified and criticised his actions. Some say that the Fireflies have demonstrated nothing but incompetence throughout the story, so someone like Joel, who was a natural pessimist, probably doesn't fancy their chances of actually pulling off their master plan. Others have just repeated the mantra, the world took something from Joel, so Joel took something from the world. But in all honesty, I don't think that Joel for a second even considered the pros and cons of what the Fireflies would be able to do with a vaccine. He just wanted to see his daughter again. In the prologue, soldiers were killing people left, right and centre, whether they were infected or not, in order to control the spread. The government killed his daughter for the sake of humanity, and he didn't get a choice in the matter. And by the time that he arrives at the hospital in the game's climax, he was not going to let it happen again. At the beginning of his journey, Joel didn't have much. Sure, he was friendly with Tess, maybe even more than friendly, but I don't think that he valued life all that much. After the year he had with Ellie, I really think he did. When he tells her, you find something worth fighting for, he subconsciously rubs his watch. For Joel, she is that thing, and watching that personal growth is why The Last of Us is so compelling. Hello everybody, thank you very much for watching, I do hope you enjoyed this video. I absolutely adore this game, it's one of my favourites, and I think with the currently airing TV show, it's really cool because every week me and my dad get to talk about it and we get to say, you know, what we noticed that was different and what was similar to the game, and it's just really cool to be able to have that conversation, and this is a project that just seems to span across all generations. Let me know what you think of The Last of Us, it's PS5 remake, or the TV show. I'm happy to hear your thoughts on anything because I just love this property so much. But that's it, so don't forget to leave a like down below if you enjoyed, subscribe for more of this stuff, and you can even go follow me over on Instagram if you want to see um, teasers as to what I'm doing next and just what I'm doing in life. But that's it, thank you all very much, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.